welcome everybody. It's such a, it's such a great privilege uh, to have uh, Mr. Hamdi Ulukaya here. Uh, I was just telling him at our meeting that he's a celebrity now and he couldn't, he could hardly believe it. But how, how many have seen Hamdi 60 Minutes, uh, the various things? It's, 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 it's so great what he's done. Many of you know the story. Um, I, uh, I, I'm going to let him tell you the story, but um, uh, I began hearing about what he was doing with uh, Chobani. First of all, I eat a lot of Chobani yogurt, but what he did to employ refugees, what he did to share uh, profits with, um, uh, w with his employees is really one of the great, great remarkable stories uh, in the world today. We've been talking today about, um, uh, about how to just think completely differently about refugees. Um, uh, the Chobani has more than 30% of their employees uh, as refugees. He has a uh, full-time, round-the-clock um, uh, translation in 11 different languages inside his factory. Uh, but um, we're, we talk today about completely changing the way uh, we think about our work uh, with refugees to change the story, to change the narrative, which is why it's so great to have uh, um, uh, uh, Hamdi here with us. Maybe I'll just start by asking you, Tell us your story. It's such, it's such an amazing story. Some of them I'm sure know about it, but I'd love to hear it right from sure. you. Sure. Uh, and before I do that, Dr. Kim, I want to thank you for, for having me here. Um, I met Dr. Kim in Oxford this past summer, and he said it upstairs so I can have a freedom to say it here. I said, why would I meet him? He must be a boring guy. <laughs> and, and I didn't want to go. And I got to tell you, when I sit in the office, I thought I was an entrepreneur on high energy, and I come up with an idea. He inspired me so much during that meeting, we immediately came back, and, and we changed our thinking how we get the uh, tent alliance in our way to get some impact for investment, because we knew there was a leader in this amazing institution that thinking alike, thinking the same way, finding solutions, and quick solutions, and impactful solutions. So. And then I found this place. This is a really cool place. So um, if one day you need a yogurt expert, I'll be willing to have an office here, sir. I, uh, I'll definitely move in. My story is very simple. I'm from eastern part of Turkey. I'm a, a, a Kurd from Turkey. I grew up in a very small village in, in by the Euphrates River. Um, grew up with shepherds, um, farming, uh, making cheese and yogurt. Um, and I went to university in Ankara in studying politics because I wanted to be the, the mayor of the city that I was growing up. I thought that was a big shot, so I, I want to be that guy. Um, and then I got involved with human rights and issues, and I started publishing newspapers, and I got in trouble with the government a little bit, and that forced me to move to U.S. So I am actually, I left without my willingness. I, I, I was kind of forced to leave. And New York City in 94, and then six months later, I found myself in upstate New York working in a farm, which that was the first time I felt myself like I'm home again in upstate New York working in this farm. And I went to uh, a, a school in SUNY Albany to learn English. I couldn't speak English at that time, like not even a word. And I made cows and did everything that you do in the farm. Um, and then my father visited me one day and he said, you should make cheese here. They don't have good cheese here. And I said, okay, yeah, I thought they don't, but why would I do that? I, I didn't move thousands of miles to come here and do exactly what we were doing back home. And I started making some cheese to make social story. And one day in my office, I saw an ad and said, fully equipped yogurt plant for sale. And it was about six o'clock in the evening, and I throw it to garbage can. And then about 10, 15 minutes later, I picked it up. And this was now with the cigarette ashes and teas and all that stuff dirty, when I called the number. And it turns out it was a craft was closing the factory in this town that was about an hour from me, and they were asking for $700,000. And I said, that's really a reasonable price. Went there, looked at the plant, and on my way back, and I called my attorney, and I said, I just saw a plant that this big company is closing. I'd like to buy it. It's just $700,000. And he said, well, this big company is closing because they don't think there's a business in there anymore. The plant is old. They're selling as is. They're probably looking for an idiot Turk to unload it to. 
And I said, no, I feel good about this. I, I think it's, he said, Hamdi, the second problem you have is you don't have money. You, you haven't paid me for the last six months. <laughs> to make story short, we found this nice program that's called SBA loan, where it supports small businesses to start and bank to lend money. And then I got the key for the plant for August 15, 2005. With, I hired the five people from fi previous 55. And the first thing we did is we paint the walls of the plant that had never been painted for the last 20 years. And that was the only idea I could come up with to do that summer. I had no other idea what I could do. Um, to make the story short, in 2007, I launched Chobani with those five people. And by 2012, we were a billion in sales. We were one of the fastest growing company in, in consumer good place. Uh, we stayed independent. We never raised capital outside of, we did it internally. That 55 people who worked in that factory, we had 1,000. And then I built a plant in Idaho, less than a year, cost me $450 million. First time I visited in Idaho, I fell in love with the state, and I said, this is the place I will build it. And then hired 1,000 people there. Uh, now we have, and I bought a plant in Australia, did the same thing. We have about over 2,000 people. Our sales is about one and a half billion. Uh, we have number two plant in the country. Um, and, I, and, and, and the, in front of my own eyes, I got into something that I hate because I grew up hating CEOs and I grew up hating businesses. I come up from a very rural area where I look at businesses that get advantage of ordinary people. So one thing I put in the standards, Dr. Kim, is I said, everything I hate cannot be in here. And I've never been to business school. I've never worked in anywhere else other than farming my, my, with my father. But I, what I try to do is, in my living experience, what is the ideal environment that I can build that I'm happy and easy to go to sleep to? How did you come up with the idea of Chobani? I remember when I first tried Chobani, it was so much better. Because the, the yogurt you have before is runny and watery, and you like, you're mixing it with almost like jelly or jam kind of preserved stuff. How did you come up with the idea, and how did it catch on? So uh, the first is a human need. I grew up with yogurt, and I know there's a lot of Turkish people working here, but yeah, I'm so proud of you. How many guys. Turkish people <laughs> working here today? Oh, uh, all right. All right. Uh, Very good. So if you're if you from Turkey, I mean, it's something that it's in your table, in your breakfast, in your lunch, in your dinner. You don't think about it, but it's the simplest, most delicious thing. So when you miss it from outside, you say, like, why wouldn't they have this in here? So that's one thing. The second one is I, I, I watch this Greek yogurt take off in a small areas in New York City and you know, fancy stores and expensive places. So I combined those two and I said, if I make it for ordinary people, and if I make it accessible, and if I keep it simple, mm -hmm. this could be something really, really meaningful. Mm -hmm. And that's what I bet on. For two years, I worked on it. But I've never done this before. I know it going into the retail business is extremely difficult. But when I sold it to the first store in, it was a kosher store in Long Island. And when I get the signs and I went into the first retail store in ShopRite, that minute, it was end of 2007, I knew this was not going to be about selling, it was going to be about, can I make it enough? Because it's extremely difficult for a food startups to compete with the big monster companies in the retail space. And so that means five years I never left the factory, ever. Slept in the floor, uh, shoulder to shoulder with my colleagues. And we didn't even realize what we had built until I came out 2012, and they said, wow, you built something that wasn't done before. Yeah. When did you start uh, hiring refugees? So that is, I live in Utica. I don't know if anybody's been to Utica, Norwich area. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful community. So I lived in this small, like a dormitory-like place. And I would hear in the community that there are a lot of refugees settled in Utica, and they're having a really hard time finding jobs. And where I am in 30 miles south, I'm hiring. I hired everyone I could in that area. And all the ex-craft workers, farmers start coming up, and there is this buzzing that happens. So I went to the uh, refugee center, and I said, what's your problem? Why can't you find jobs? 
And he says, well, there's language, there's training, and there's transportation. And he said, OK, these are very solvable. So we'll, we'll get translators, we'll get cars or buses, and, and we will do through the translators the training. So that started in 2010, actually. And I applied the same thing in 2012 to Idaho. In the end, we have about 16 different nationalities, you know, very diverse workforce. Until the refugees started working in our plants, I was the only foreign person that they could see. I, I was the weak one, weird one. Um, and now we have people from Asia and Africa and Middle East, uh, South America, and making this beautiful cup of yogurt building life. Mm. And I saw this for five years in front of my eyes, these people, the minute they got the job, that they start building their life. They start owning house, they start kids to go to the colleges, they start paying taxes, they start getting married with people in the community. This magic started happening. And, and when I saw the, the Yazidis attacked in Sinjar Mountains, that's when I start coming up outside of the workforce of Chobani and say, what else can we do? And that's yeah. why I start thinking about tent. Did that cause problems? Were there resentments in the community that you were hiring uh, refugees? How, Zero. how did that work? Zero. Zero. Yeah. Zero. I mean, there was some news, you know, come out. Most of them were inaccurate. These are two communities welcomed refugees forever. Mm -hmm. You know, I I even in Idaho yeah. um, and, and Utica. Um, the settlements is happening in the American history in these communities is, is forever. Mm. Uh, this time it was probably a little bit more at the time that I started, but I, I've never heard any problem mm. at all. Tell us about Idaho. You were, you, when, when we first met, <coughs> you just told me the most wonderful story about it wasn't just the factory, but the entire community began to change as a result of uh, your decision to locate there. T tell yes. us about I that. I mean, I, you know, you share the same thought, Dr. Kim. And, the business is really strong, extremely effective to make changes in the community by just act of business, but with a nice edge of right mindset, like I could make a difference. Um, and it doesn't take too long to know you are in the right community. Uh, I've never been, I had never been to Idaho before, and I met the governor, Governor Bridge, and then the city officials. It's just like immediately get elevated. You say, okay, this is the place I'd like to be. This is the community I'd like to be. And of course, there are a lot of farmers, a lot of milk, the, the West Coast, very like business way of doing, biz, you know, doing work, very less bureaucracy. And we started with the idea of $150 million plant. By the time, a few months later, I said, okay, we're gonna make it bigger. So we made it 1 million square feet plant and I said, we need to build it less than a year. Mm -hmm. And so they give you a perception, the, the piping that is done in that plant, if you put it together, you would go from Idaho to Chicago. That's how much piping and everything is, complexity goes in. So that, we built it. Today, our, after, uh, that finished in 2013. Today, we doubled that investment. We're almost $900 million investment in there. So here's what happened to Idaho. Unemployment went from seven, eight, nine, ten to under two and a half, I believe. Today's problem is finding labor. We put a, um, the innovation center in there that we have scientists from all over the world hmm. that come in and, and interact with the universities and training people to be food manufacturing you know, experts. After us is probably five food companies and a few other packaging and food processing companies that come in. So Magic Valley, Idaho and Magic Valley became the center of food-related industries, mm. where before, you know, you would only think of industrial potatoes and some other mm -hmm. stuff. And the economic impact of Chobani in Idaho, it, it economic people are, are saying, is about $4 billion a year. A year? A year. Wow. Because one job <coughs> becomes 10 jobs, and yeah. then there's the farms, and there's all the stuff. But, but only that, you go to... Twin Falls, Idaho today, and it's proud. We, we never own community, we never take credit for anything, but the business, by acting the right way, bringing communities as being part of this new mm. development, everybody gets excited. The downtown starts becoming active again,
people are opening restaurants, people are building hotels, mm -hmm. you know, the gas stations, and the visitors start coming. And it's this whole environment changes. You see it right by the act of business, the effect of the city. So, you know, it, it hurts me when I go cross country and see these small cities that used to be amazing. Mm -hmm. And I give two examples of South Edmonton, New York, and, and Twin Falls, Idaho. But just going in there and being with the community, investing in there and trusting, mm -hmm. and letting community be part of it, and create products that everybody is proud of, and let the magic happen. Mm -hmm. And it happens. It happens here, it can happen anywhere around the world. So you, 30% uh, of your workforce is refugees, and you just created a profit sharing program where 10% of all the stock, I think, in the company, you shared with your employees. And some of them became millionaires. The early ones became millionaires. So in many ways, you're doing all the things that people would tell you you can't afford to do. What have you found? Um, you know, you've been saying that this actually made the business better. How, how, has that, how has that worked? I, th I, think, I think you've been in this and you know it's, it's against the common belief. It really is. And, and, and maybe sometimes you need to see someone put it in action to see what really happens. I had one, um, one thing in my mind. And every troubles that I see in the world, can I answer with an act at Chobani? <laughs> so income inequality is a major, major issue. And I see a big sign in there, and in poverty. That's one. Income inequality is a major one, especially here in America and yeah. certain parts of the world. And I see it in front of my own eyes in that community. So I built a business with people in the plant <coughs> working day and night. I didn't do it alone. I did it with them. And I would make a calculation. I paid twice more than the, the average pay per hour in that area. Um, bonuses, profit sharing, uh, all paid health insurances, all that stuff that's easy to do, but I'm still making a calculation. I said, I just don't see it how people can retire on hmm. this kind of salary. It just doesn't work. So I had this idea very early on, but I couldn't commit until I saw Chobani that is stable, because I was taking risks all the time, and I just didn't want to promise something that I, I it would stop me making t taking some risk. When the time was right, and I said, I'm going to do this. And Dr. Kim, one of the hardest things to do is to go legal uh, over legal battles, that you couldn't get 2,000 people to be partner without being a public company. So I hired lawyers, and I had to pay a million dollars <laughs> in, in lawyers to be able to do it. So what did they do with the company? You can walk in any Chobani offices in any place, and, and you'll be talking to an owner. The productivity, of course, the care, uh, what it does to their mindset in retirement. And, and it, you just cannot identify those line by line. But I never thought I was giving a gift. I never, ever, I'm not just saying it. I thought it was my responsibility. I just acknowledged it, and I act upon it. And I understand that this is tough to do in a lot of companies because of the circumstances. But one thing that I ask my colleagues in, in the business world is that you have to be aware of this income inequality. And it's our responsibility as CEOs, businesses, and board to make sure that whichever the formula that we put it in is this is the new way of making sure that this gap is not getting widened, is actually shrinking. Mm. That they have a stake at what these companies that we built together, that they get back something out of it for their children, their families, and for their communities. And I don't see any other way that this system to, to survive if we don't get that consciousness into the businesses yeah. now. See, so you pay twice the wages, you have a profit sharing program, how does that benefit you? So you must have many, many people wanting to work at Chobani. When they get there, I'm sure they want to keep their jobs at sure. Chobani, right? Yeah, we, we, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little selfish. I, I say to the world, there are two types of people in the world. I, I've never been looking at people any other way, their colors or where I come from, and if anything, I'm the one. Um, but there are, I can't help myself to think this one discrimination that I make. There's, there are people who work for Chobani, and there are people who don't. <laughs> and, and there are people who work for Chobani and people who want to work for Chobani. <laughs> Two kinds of people. So this is a joke that we do. But beyond that, we are a family. We are a tribe. We, we, get our, we, we got each other's back. Uh, and there is this, this 
trust that you're safe here. And, and it's okay if you don't know, it's okay you didn't have the right experience, we'll figure it out, we'll figure it out together. And, and if you create that environment that there is no criticism, there is no you know, discrimination, that truly that environment exists and it's okay not to know, the time that you save is about 70%. Uh. Because we spend a lot of time pretending, mm -hmm. including myself, in the environment to fit in. And if that threat is not existing, you're faster, you're more productive, <laughs> you're productive, you don't know what to do with the time. And that's why Shabani became so fast, because the decisions are made fast, because there's no, you know, there's no changes that happen when you come from home to work. You stay mm. as who you are, and you go back who you are. And if you are yourself, you are the most creative and natural creative on yourself. You're not creating as somebody else. So you're authentic. And it brings a lot of voices. So it's that magic is happening when that environment is safe. But do you track, uh, do you have metrics? You track productivity? You, you know how everyone's um, performed? You don't do that at nah, all? No, we don't. We just say, we've got to get this in six months, and then we do it. You know? uh, we, we know we're fast. We, we know we're fast um, simply because, in a common sense, I have an old factory. I have four lane machine. It does 300 cases in, 20, in 24, uh, 12 hours when I did it first time. I have five people. I have $1 million. And in five years, I, with, I built infrastructure of almost seven, eight hundred million million. And I added productivity into the plant that four lane became two million cases a week of operation. If you logically put this together, it's just impossible. It's a 15 years history. Because in yogurt, you actually receive milk, mm -hmm. you pasteurize it, you hold it in the tank for 17, seven hours, you culture it, you fill it in the cups, you seal it, you hold it, and you ship it to customers. It requires mass amount of infrastructure. And to build that, every pump that you buy or every filler that you buy, it takes nine to 12 months mm. to from order to installation. So you can only imagine, with a common sense, this will take years and years, yeah, yeah. and hundreds of millions of dollars of capital from outside to be able to do it. But that's a common sense. But if you're elevated, and it can, elevation only can happen, not the purpose of money, it can happen for, for, for higher purposes. And if you're elevated, common sense doesn't matter anymore. You just find a way to do it. <laughs> and you know, um, and that only happens if you are magically create this environment. And it could happen in New Berlin, New York, where your lunch option is only pizza and yogurt. That's, yeah. There's nothing else. It can happen in Jordan. It can happen in Africa. It can happen in, in any part of the world. It's just that environment and mindset you put it in place. And that's human connection that you make. And then you watch magic start happening. Wow. So Tell us about the Tent Foundation. So now y this is just what you're trying to do. Take these ideas and spread them all over the world. And y so many companies have joined you. Wh wh what, are your, uh, what are your dreams? Sa same thing, Dr. Kim. I, I, I really, the minute I saw what happened in the Sinjar Mountains, and the, I, I am a conscious refugee issue person because I hired them, because I come from uh, Turkey, and, and, and surrounding areas are all refugees, and, and, and people are moving to Europe. But when I found out about what happened to Yezidis, I called my, 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 my colleague and I said, can you find out who's involved with the refugee issue as an organization? And she said, there's IRC, there's UNHCR. I said, can we reach out to UNHCR? And then I went to uh, Geneva. When I what I learned from UNHCR at that, at that time, and it just blew my mind, I didn't realize there were 55 at the time, now 65 million people, how long they stay in the refugee camp? What's the conditions? What are the what are the conditions and what are the uh, uh, you know um, challenges? And I, and how little the world of business is involved with this, and how little a general public knows about this. Mm -hmm. So when I came back, I did series of meetings, and I realized this is it. This is the area that I would like to get involved. And my goal was to get business attitude, entrepreneurial attitude innovative attitude into this. 
and UNHCR really welcomed it, IRC welcomed it. These institutions are my teachers. They told me all about this. And then seeing what happened at Chobani and knowing what IKEA did uh, at the innovation side, mm -hmm. uh, we thought, can we generate this business platform where this politically, securitily dangerous ground can be elevated into a safe place that we just into the human area we get involved. So I launched it with a couple of founding uh, partners like IKEA, LinkedIn, uh, MasterCard. Um, and then within two years, we got uh, over 80 companies. They're multinational, innovative, good companies, and they mean it. And we get a tent <coughs> alliance to bring all these companies to either supply chain, hiring, bringing innovation, and or donation. And, and get their companies and their customers and their CEOs, business mind into this. And I truly believe that once we get the private sector truly involved with this, we'll be able to make some, some changes. What would you like to see? I mean, I know you've been talking to our people about um, the work we've been doing in Jordan. You know, we created a special economic zone and it would be great to get companies. And we just talked earlier today uh, to get Nike to make Air Jordans in Jordan. Right? I mean, that's a, that, 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 that was, thing. That would be great, right? Yeah. But what, there's, it's so difficult to get companies to do that. What, what do we need to do? So, um, so I, think, I think there are two things we have to do. First of all, the companies have to realize that when you get social envy, involved in social envy, not, we call it beyond CSR, not, like, not the CSR check the right. box, but you really get involved. You really mean it. You really, it's in your DNA. So that impact is just, Enormous. Enormous on your people, enormous on your company, enormous on your customers, enormous on your product innovation. What it does to your company is enormous. It's, you have to understand that that's true. It's hard to do, but it's, it's, it's there. The second thing is where the consumer is going is, let's face it, the world wants, the people want, and a lot of, vast majority of people want, what are you doing for humanity? What are you doing for your community? What are you doing for your society? So the cus customer demands it. Um, so on climate, on poverty, on AIDS, on you know, so many other issues, and some of them you and your, your organization led it. There's a lot of things that are happening, positive things. In the issue of refugees, it's been a little bit challenging because it's mixed with terrorism, it's mixed with political landscape, and it says identification is not right. You just mentioned you know, how many immigrants and refugees has, has impacted in, in innovation and companies and, and art and science and all that stuff. But yet still still a, still a little bit of challenging area. So we have two reasons, two ways to get this done. We have to elevate the brand into a place where everybody feels safe and everybody understands this is a human place and we do a branding issue. So refugee has a branding issue, we need to fix that. We, we, we gotta fix that. And I think we find a way to do it because there are a lot of creative people can do that. The second thing is you said it perfectly, whether you like it or not, Making products in Jordan, making products in Lebanon, or other parts of refugee-rich areas, and, and proving a model that this is good for your business, then it becomes sustainable. Even if you don't like it, you would love to make it because it's good for your brand, it's good for your business. And we need to start with one, and let's call Nike first, and let's get them in there. And if, <laughs> if Nike does it, and a couple of other brands does it, I think we can, we can we can really make a difference because if businesses and brands start investing in, in countries like Jordan uh, and Lebanon and Turkey, Ethiopia and all that area where the 90% of the refugees are and these are poor or poorest countries in the world that carry in most of the burden, it's amazing what they are doing and then a lot of has changed with the leadership of World Bank, changing the laws on the taxes and you're making it easier to get investments in there. So there is rules and regulations are pretty much in a good place. And some countries need to make this easier for the foreign investments to come in and make things a lot easier from the regulation perspective. And we do the branding side. Um, I r I'm really excited that we can, we can make some difference. Well, Hamdi, let me so the, the management lessons you've just given us are completely different from what mostly you learn. 
You create an environment where people can be themselves. You create an environment where there are 11 different languages that are translated all the time, people from many different backgrounds. Uh, what happens if you leave the company? Does the culture continue? And how can you bring what you did uh, to other companies and frankly to the world? Because we, you know, we're moving in the opposite direction. If you listen to the newspapers, if you listen to the discourse today, we're moving away from the kind of notions of human solidarity across religions, across racial groups, across uh, you know, uh, 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 gender, and moving in a direction where people are defining who they are and, and looking inward. How, how do you bring, one, your management tools, the, the, the management lessons you've learned to these companies? Because it strikes me that they're going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult to work in a place where there are Jordanians working next to Syrians and creating that kind of environment. Um, uh, so first question, what happens if you leave the company? Does the culture continue? And then how do you bring that uh, to what we're now trying to do in these very, very difficult places, places where there's fragility and conflict and violence? How do we bring it? It's, I will go from, start from my side. I, I would say I picture myself being out of Shabani um, every day and for the longest time, because clearly I didn't want to build a high sales organization, like you've sold it $1 billion worth of com uh, products and you're worth, I don't know, so many billions, whatever. I, I valued it is, have I built an institution? Have I built an infrastructure? Because that is the hardest thing to do. And that is built on top of a culture. And I always say people, and I say cultures are not built with an ad campaign, it's not built what's written in the walls, it's, writ it's, it's, it's built by stories lives within the walls. It's basically cultures are stories. And, and I always say the cultures are not built in, you know, quick shots, it's filled with minutes and hours and weeks and months and years, a combination of that becomes a culture. And and I'm lucky because I was with there, I was there, and every act of me, what I do in it, is I was thinking about in a big picture. If I'm acting like this today, what's it going to mean two years from now, three years from now? So it's very, very strong. If I am not there, it will probably, I hope that it means something, that you know, it will affect them a little bit. But I'm 100%, I'm, I'm not 100%, but I am more confident today than I was three, four years ago, uh, that they will do the right thing. One of the things that they will never do is they will, they will never cross the lines that they've never done, like using preservatives, using artificial things, uh, going outside of making simple food, or treating each other in a different way, or purpose of making community better, or all that stuff is I'm 100% confident. On the innovation side, we, we're just going to make sure that it's more and more has to come. Um, Dr. Kim, this is two things are going to happen, either the large so-called established companies who's not acting right need to change their behavior and be more human, more social, and, and doesn't mean that you're less profitable, but just more conscious of humanity in the world, or they're going to be uh, in a garbage can. They just will. The, because the new entrepreneurs and startups and the new way of business models are completely opposite what we have seen in the last few Every entrepreneur I meet and I see, they come in into the marketplace, they want to do things right. And they don't even want to do things right only in this country, they want to do things right in everywhere in this country. More and more people are closer and more worried about the issues and they want to find solutions. In the business schools, people want to work with companies or institutions that they change, that they make changes. That's what people get excited about. And if we marry that with making money and creating wealth for the shareholders and, and the stakeholders and the, and the community, then it becomes a very popular place because people don't have to choose doing the right thing and, and earning and living. And if we can create that, that environment that satisfies both sides of it, it, then it becomes magical. And it would be crazy not to implement in your business, but it's very, very difficult established 100 years old business to act completely that way. So somebody needs to go and, and totally do this. But I'm betting on small ones. I'm betting on the startups because I was once. So that's why I started Chobani Incubator. And every three, four months, I bring 
handful of new startups that I think that if I was investing on them, I would totally invest. They have the right product, they have the right founders in behind, they have the right philosophy, and I can see them making differences. And we give them money, we give them offices, we give them access to all Chobanis, including myself, for months, and we introduce them to our com customers. And we take nothing in back. The only thing that we want from them is succeed and do something right in the, in the marketplace. Business is good. Uh, capitalism, if that's a capitalism, is good. Money making is good as long as has the right mindset of doing it. And if, if that has the right mindset, the biggest changes happens and the fastest changes happens and it's sustainable at the same time. So we just have to hope for this new generation that's coming in that you're inspiring and maybe a little bit of Chobani's history and, and, and new startups are coming in and convincing people that doing business in the right way is the most profitable, fastest, and you sleep so good at night that this is the best way to do the best way to do it. And I think we can do some convincing. Have you had an inf influence already in Turkey? Is are there, are, are yeah, there, I, brought, I brought 35 fellows and startups from Turkey this summer. And the same thing, uh, I, the second food incubator or incubators class, uh, I went to 29 regions on Turkey. Because in Istanbul, it's easy to get the entrepreneurs to US or Israel or any other places where the entrepreneurship is big. I actually went to rural areas and picked up the greatest minds, I like to say. And I brought them uh, to, Ura uh, to, to New York under Chobani Incubator with NYU. And we had a, a really nice program. And I'd like to do that in Jordan. I'd like to do it in other places. Uh, I was in the President Obama's um, entrepreneurship ambassador uh, things, which he meant a lot. And I hope that continues that the US inspires entrepreneurs all around the world to do the right thing. Um, and, and, and help their communities because this is extremely meaningful and it really helps. So what, um, as a final, uh, what would you tell us at the World Bank Group? What, what do we need to do better? What do we need to do differently um, to, to help you and Tent really build these great businesses uh, with great values all over the world? Um, first of all, I'm really honored again to be with you in here. My knowledge of World Bank, I, of course, I've heard it so long, and I know it was an, a, a, a huge institution, an important institution, but I had no idea about it until I met you. <laughs> so, 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 so I'm just learning about it, and I, I, I really, like people say, small, nimble, and fast is better. And I said, no, big with the right mindset has a good you know, power that can be used in the right place, that's better. Mm. That's a lot better. You don't have to spend time to build it because it already exists. And you look at this area, people, I mean, I just interact with some of your colleagues and had a meeting in all day. I don't even know how the time passed. There's magic here, and I know it's a big week for you, Dr. Kim, and all, the, all your people, that this magic here is, is the whole world is here, mm -hmm. and whole world's issues in your mind, in your thoughts, and, and you try to solve that, that's, that's something that is extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one thing that I, will, I, will, I see in you, and I hope it continues, is taking risk is okay. It's just take some risk and invest in some innovative ideas, and, 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 and trust, trust the self-control other than the government guarantees and everything else, that people do the right thing, and it will do, and if it does, World Bank can really, really solve a lot of problem, and it is already, especially when it comes to refugees. And getting World Bank and your power and, and your institution's power to convince some countries to let people to work in that community, convince that this is an economically right thing to do, and then get the rest of the world to invest and and help them, help them to mm -hmm. get through these challenges and, and be an environment where the entrepreneurs and the startups and CEOs and like us to come and share and learn and, and use their power to each other. And I told my, my colleague here is that the, having Dr. Kim's attention with us, it gives us so much power mm -hmm. because we can go so many worlds and then say, you know, uh, we have message or we have call and made it from them. It's a great power, and I think 
what your approach is getting the business private sector in the right mindset into this action is extremely powerful. Okay, so the commitment we made is we're gonna travel together to Jordan and Lebanon, and we're gonna get at least one business from the tent group up and running within one year. Done. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you.